Can you hear me all right? I can. You can hear me? Am I loud enough? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Cool. So, yeah, I just figured uh, what better way. I was going to, my idea was like, oh, gym and nutrition, but like that, that might be in the future. I think it's good to start with one, then we'll move on to the other and do them separately. And then eventually we can tie them together when we have like a busy channel. So I just figured we can keep people's attention. You know, they can, they can see something in the kitchen. They can see something in the gym. And um, But right now we're still kind of like getting the reps in, figuring out where to post this. And um, I'm going to set up a system so that people are incentivized. So they'll get like entries into the contest when they come to our Facebook lives or YouTube lives. So there'll be more incentive for people to show up. Um but yeah, I think without further ado, since this is going to be a live recording, we should go ahead and get started and basically like make this, we have an hour, we should make this like a session. Want me to just walk you through a session? Oh, you're going to tell you what to do. Is this your, is this your rest day? Is that okay? Um, can you position the camera a little lower? Like if you were going to do something on the floor? I can't. You can't? Okay. Well, I can drop it, but it would take me a while to set it back up. Okay. All right. Um, reason I was asking is because I thought we I, – I didn't know where you'd want to start. Maybe you'd want to start with today being about warm-ups, or uh, maybe we can just talk about – we can get right to the bread and butter. People are always asking questions about what should my workout look like if I'm trying to lose weight? What should my workout look like if I'm just trying to tone? What should my workout look like if I'm trying to add muscle? Um, I think we can kind of go through that that segment here. So – um, yeah, on that one, if you want me to flip it over, I can use the whiteboard and we can go over like a weight loss program, um, a toning program. But you let me know. Yeah, let's turn it around. Let's look at the whiteboard and let's start with. Uh, can, do you have any empty space on there? Can we start talking about warm ups? Yeah, let me just erase it real quick. I'm gonna find my eraser somewhere. And then we'll talk about warm ups. And all the things that is essential to a warm up. People probably like to skip that part of the workout or might be too rushed with their schedules. So they just roll in anyway. But yeah, you know, the key importance of a warm up is to get circulation going, um, raise your core body temperature, and ensure proper mobility. Because a lot of times we, um, we can have tightness lingering in different areas. Um, we're going to have muscles that stay engaged. Since we sit a lot, um, we and tend to get tight hip flexors and tight quad muscles. You, you got to think that you're sitting when you're at work, you're sitting when you're driving, you're sitting when you're at home, you're sitting when you're eating. Um, so it's important to kind of counteract that um, over firing of those muscles by you, we, we have different like inhibition techniques to turn off certain muscles. And then more importantly, we have uh, activation techniques to um, turn on the synergistic muscle, kind of like the, the opposite side of the body's muscle that's responsible for that area. And if we can strengthen that one, we can prevent from the reoccurring tightness of the other muscle from uh, occurring. So let's take a look at the whiteboard here. I just got to flip it around. So there we go. You can read it. It won't be flipped. But Let's start with how long should a warm up be? Really five minutes, like five to eight minutes. Simple, right? Um, it, it, it can be 10, 15 minutes. Some people like to take yeah. a little longer. That's fine. Yeah. Um, well, I think, I but, think one where people get confused is they, they, they don't know what to do for a warm up, right? They don't want to do like all this stuff, like for two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, and then they want to do this type like stretching and they kind of want to full roll. And before they know it, it is like 10, 15 minutes, which I'm fine with, but something quick where it's like, you know, prep work where it could be front planks, dead bugs, or cable rotations, some jumping jacks, call it a day. I will say this though, just kind of covering all of our bases. Uh, by the way, I can't see your face. I don't know if you can. Back up a little bit or turn the camera. Yeah, I'm but, um, back or, or like duck down a little bit. But, um, you know, if we were going to look at kind of all the things that are options for our warm up, um, I know people, yeah, that's better. I know people are going to foam roll. And I just want to say that 
I think foam rolling, um, if you're going to do it, it should come exactly. First thing, first thing, it's movement prep. It's preparing before you're actually moving. Um, and, and, and I would say that foam roll is more like soft tissue work and should be done kind of as needed um, in special case scenarios when things are, are lingering or mobility is poor in certain areas. But what's funny is when it comes to certain lifts, um, sometimes people think it's a strength issue and actually it's a mobility issue and coordination issue. So right. I would say we're, we're going to add foam rolling to the top of the list there. You're going to spend no more than three minutes foam rolling, honestly, because people just kind of beat their muscle to a pulp um, and they're really not doing themselves any good past um, just deactivating the muscle, turning it off. Um, you know, I think the next step from there for me would be just mobility, movement. You know, like we said, movement prep is first, then we move, and then we worry about getting our heart rate up. But mobility it is probably going to be... Do you consider dynamic stretching to be mobility? I completely agree. Dynamic, yeah. not static. A thousand percent. Meaning with, with movement, again, movement with movement. Otherwise, people do these static hold stretches... And that's good for after the workout. The reason being is you're still not warm yet. All you did was get into the gym and you foam rolled. You don't want to start stretching a static cold muscle um, because then you could possibly injure the fibers. Well, and, and think about it for the foam roll because you're pushing blood to the muscle and out of the muscle. You're creating a pump. So you are bringing new nutrients in and technically getting ready for it to warm up. Okay. Why would you people want to static stretch after that? Static stretching is, is just more of a cool down. It's not going to influence that pump mechanism more. So it's not going to benefit you. So I think that's where a lot of people get confused. They're like, oh, I just got to static stretch. It's like, well, no. Because if you want to go okay. do a run or get on a, a bike or even start lifting, those muscles need to contract and relax quick. If you static right. stretch, you kind of stay in that length of length state, and then that's where you get injured. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, a counterintuitive to static stretch after your foam roll. So we go into mobility movement patterns. And I would say this is more of um, mobility of ranges of motion that you're not used to being in. So uh, something like the world's greatest stretch, you can Google that and check that one out. That covers a lot of bases. And that's really uncomfortable for people to do that stretch, which is simply just standing up, doing a toe touch, walking your hands out till you're in a high, high plank position, Bring one leg next to your arm and then rotate up to the ceiling, switch sides, and then walk your hands back. That's pretty exhausting for people. Um, but then you know, there's other things that are important to address, like ankle mobility, because a lot of us have tight calves or tight soleus. Um, hip mobility, which is super important. A lot of us have really tight hips and we don't recognize it. Uh, and then shoulder mobility. Shoulder and neck mobility, I think, are kind of one and the same. And the reason being is because joint by joint theory will tell us about how one joint is supposed to be stable, the next mobile. And this is how our, our structure uh, with, has integrity because we are a tensegrity structure, meaning we don't, we don't have like bricks that are building us up. We have lots of like bone connected with muscle. So you can think of lots of sticks held together by rubber bands and what gives our body structural integrity is that balance, that synergistic balance of um, tension pulled in different directions. So if we have really tight hips from sitting all the time, it's going to affect the way we squat. It's going to affect the way we uh, even do something simple as running. It's going to affect the way that we uh, position ourselves for other exercises like a press or, or a pull. So it's important to really ensure that you have these ranges of motion with your hip, specifically like opening up the hip, uh, being able to extend uh, um, your glute all the way, like extend that hip all the way down without feeling that hip flexor. Um, but then we will, we can get into more of um, some mobility stuff uh, when we when we rotate the camera back to the gym. But so foam roll mobility. Where are we going next? Are you raising core temperature? On this one, I like to go. Yeah, so I like to go. Me personally, I like to go core training or as we want to call it abs. 
I don't think people want to think like, oh, sit ups, crunches. No, I'm thinking more front planks, planks, dead bomb. We're specifically talking about the TVA here, transverse abdominis. Yeah, that deep core and your obliques. So I say obliques and then the TVA, right? That's the most important one. All of the abs don't really care. But usually with that, you're going to get an increase of um, temps. Like people are going to get warm really quick when they hold that isometric position for the thorax and pelvis. They're going to be like, holy smokes, I'm warming up because they're going to try to breathe. Diaphragm is going to move with the ribs and the obliques holding them in opposition. And they'll feel that real quick and they'll get warm because the body is now in an uncomfortable right. state of breathing. Right. It will turn the neurological system on even more. And, that, and that's where I kind of like to get people. Like, you want to get someone a little aggravated at you, a little pissed off a little bit. So it could be even, now this is you know, more of an anecdotal thing. Like you could say something that's going to frustrate someone. I wouldn't recommend it all the time, but if you know that person, that usually will stimulate their central nervous system to put them on like this fight or flight mode into more sympathetic. So I'll tell some of my athletes like, hey, it's good that I want to get you mad and I'm going to have them hold their breath for, you know, a breath hold here. I'm going to force and long exhale and hold. So then they're, you can see their pupils dilate and they're like, okay, what's going on? Their central nervous system is priming for basically saying, hey, I'm going to fight and survive. I now know that they're ready for, you know, what comes next, where I want to take them on a lift or a run or something. Um, yeah. For people starting out, that's not a thing. But if you are doing that and you want to use breath holds or some kind of core work, that is a great avenue to increase temperature, central nervous system stimulation. You know, what um, What I, I like to think about it is, is like a threshold. It's like going from one room to the next. There's like that little threshold bump. And it's the same thing going from like parasympathetic or at rest to sympathetic and about to get into work. It's like that little threshold. And, and, as, and as an athlete, sure, you can absolutely um, cue them a little bit to get uncomfortable. But I think most people recognize that that is the hardest part anyway. I remember having a couple of clients and I'd have them jump on the treadmill for like three minutes before we'd start lifting. And they would be like, this is the worst three minutes of my life and it feels like right. forever and it is it's because it's like you're ramping yourself into into gear so to speak and your body's kind of resisting it's trying to hold on to that rest period not realizing that no we're about to get sympathetic it's time to go but i do like um you know i would have named number three kind of raising core temperature but i like that we named it core in general because you're going to do that anyway you're going to raise your core body temperature by you know activating your core and really turning that on before the rest of the workout the other ones that I really love, you know, Eric talked about planks, dead bugs. I really like a modified side plank position because that really gets the obliques firing. Because a lot of times when we think about core training, think, people think about sit-ups. And that's going to hit your rectus abdominis. And when you're trying to get like a six-pack, you're looking for what's called those tendinous inscriptions. And that's going to be like the front layer. You can think about just like getting um, a facelift. Right, like you're just doing that front layer. You're not really doing anything underneath. You're not strengthening the muscles underneath. And what's important about the core is it's the cylinder. It's actually the cylinder that comes from our neck to our hip. So it's this entire piece that holds on to our arms, our head, our legs, and they, and they hold everything together. Without that, we're firing a cannon out of a canoe, and we're not being efficient with our energy, and we could possibly get hurt. So when we talk about um, the transverse abdominis, we're talking about thoracolumbar fascia. We're talking about like our internal, our body's internal corset. So planks, dead bugs, modified side plank. I also love um, the bird dog holds specifically to, and with breathing to try to engage more of that TVA. And then a half kneeling glute pulse because without proper hip positioning, we don't have good core control. So I, I like kind of pairing keeping the two together because you're going to get pelvic floor uh, control with the, the half kneeling glute pulse. But then let's move on to, to step four. So, so here, I mean, sort of like your treadmill thing, I like to do some sort of, let's call it aerobic based work. Um, it doesn't have to be long, but more something where that heart rate is going to be elevated up into the 130 to 150 zone. So I like things like med ball slams, jump ropes, kettlebell swing, something full body dynamic that really gets the body in motion. I know we talked about 
warming up the body. And I think there's a big disclaimer here. It's like you can't just sit in the sauna and get warm. That doesn't mean you're warmed up. Like you need to warm up. Like yes, you're, the definition of a warm up is to literally increase your core temperature by one degree Celsius. Like that's literally the warm up. That's what it is. And you could do that sitting in a sauna in a steam room, but that doesn't mean the muscles are prepped for that. So yeah, you're right. increasing like core temperature but you're also thinking like peripheral like blood flow temperature too it's like you are stimulating the muscles for reaction so a lot of times like i like power work even if it jumps med ball slams kettlebell swings and so we're like a mini circuit there that's where i like to do what about you i would call that i would call step four um goal specific because here's the thing is i i totally agree with you um especially if someone's goal is weight loss or just general fitness. But if someone's goal is, is strength or muscle development, I'll just have them pick up the barbell and they're just going to do, you know, after we've done the, the, the foam rolling work, the mobility, the core activation, we're going to do just like some, some shrugs, some high pulls, some tall cleans, and, but in a way that's taxing on their system. Like I'm trying to get them to the point where they, they have to put the barbell down. Um, so I think goal specific, Goal specific, um, specific what? Is it, is it, would you call it overload? Goal specific overload? Goal specific power? Goal specific. Um, yeah, you would call it power, right? Explosive, you call it complexes. Like, almost like you ESD can, prep. I would say ESD prep, like energy system. Energy system, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Energy system development prep because you raise your core temperature, but you haven't primed your energy systems to keep up with the demand of the actual specific workout. So, yeah, that's why I love and I'll do it with clients, too. We'll start off with like a series. It might be like some, some banded adductions, some med ball slams and some farmers carries just to really fire on their system and get their body ready to produce that much ATP and recover between bouts. And, um, and farmers carries are one of the best ones to use. And it doesn't have to be something like crazy. It could be something on the lighter side of this work. So you could go like, if you want to mix it both with like med ball slams for six reps for power, and then a farmer's carry for a couple rounds, like that's going to get your energy systems ready. If you were to go to, if you want to work power into a clean, a jerk or a press, or if you're going right into sprint work, like this is still going to prep you for it. Yeah. 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 So, you know, a couple of examples, you know, like you said, like the med ball slams, the farmers carries, that's a great uh, superset. You can do something like a single arm snatch with like a, a side plank rotation. That's another great one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you can do. I'm sure you've done this, Matt. Barbell complexes, like take an empty bar, like you said, shrugs, clean, swaps, presses, rest it, do like two, three rounds of that. Snatch and press, overhead presses, push presses. Yeah, totally. Just like keep doing a bunch of different movements with the barbell that you're going to be doing for the rest of that day. So a lot of squatting, a lot of pressing, a lot of timing work. Because when it comes to Olympic lifting or building strength, um, it's really about timing and efficiency with the, like your breath and body moving together as one. And you don't want to jump right to like 135 or 250, 225 without your body being primed to know how to breathe, to how to control its it's thoracolumbar fascia with weight, you know, in a bar on your back or in your front rack position. Um, but yeah, let's uh, let's rotate over now. Let's take a look at the gym. Let's go from billboard to, to gym to gym now. So I think that that covers the warm up. Back. All right. All right, so so we just did all those four things. We just did our foam rolling, we did our mobility, we did our core, and we did our energy system priming. Now we're gonna move into the first exercise. And you know, if you're someone who's just looking for strength, um, you're probably gonna do just one exercise and focus all your attention and energy on that one exercise with five reps, anywhere from one to five reps and sets can be anywhere from three to five, and you're gonna have a two to five minute rest in between. And if your goal is general fitness or weight loss, you're gonna to wanna to have more of a circuit style to your workouts. Uh, we're gonna to wanna to try to expand time under tension at your current strength and fitness levels. So I like to start people off with the squat. Yep, so I, I, 
I like to go with what I've done now, even with General Pop, is a clean or a kettlebell split clean. And I think for a General Pop, Tell it's a us. good exercise because it's full body, it's high demand, and it gets people moving. And there's a lot of research and articles that show that hand cleans are one of the most caloric demanding of the exercise because it's full bodies. And I'm not, I know people might be listening and be like, oh, how do we do a hand clean? I can't do a barbell. If you have a dumbbell or a kettlebell, it's pretty simple. You can do them the same, and, yeah. Um, I remember during the wedding, we were like doing med ball cleans with a heavy med ball. Like stuff like that is fun, but you can get people moving and you can do it into a squat pattern. You can do it into a high catch. That's where I really like to take my people. And if you, if someone's listening, have the ability to do something like that, like tell them to try it out uh, to get the benefit. But then 100% agree. Usually one of my first exercises is a squat. Like, yeah. But to your point, um, like I don't, I don't have everybody do a barbell clean, but I will absolutely have people do a dumbbell clean or kettlebell clean. And simply like from the floor coming up to do a kettlebell clean, it's so easy. I have people who are 70 years old that are doing a, a kettlebell clean because they're yep. just pulling it up and rotating they, their hands. They love it. And even, so even I have like clients with barbell or dumbbells, literally in a clean is an explosive, literally explosive bicep curl. So they don't, they don't like it, right. what a clean is. And I'm like, well, think hips back, right? By two dumbbells. You're coming up and you're catching right here fast. It's a very explosive bicep curl and it gets people moving in a full body triple extension pattern. And you can have two dumbbells in your hands. Yeah. And, and um, it's funny you said that because if you're pregnant, I have a client who's nine months pregnant and we just do dumbbell queens because the belly's in the way for the, for the barbell. Um, but she was someone who was comfortable with the barbell prior to the pregnancy. So that's why it was easy to translate over. Um, but yeah, the reason these these are so important versus something like just a single arm press or, or a seated machine press or a seated leg press is because of the demand they're putting on your body. No program is going to deliver results unless it has various stimuli of getting the individual uncomfortable. And most of the times when we're, when we're dipping our toes in the water and we're getting started in our workout or on a new program, we really try to take it e too easy. And I totally get it. We don't want to get ourselves hurt. We don't want to flare anything up. But it's important to bring that intensity in a safe way into your workouts. So start light. Start with 10, 15 pounds. If you can do five reps in your circuit, you should have like a three-exercise circuit. Say that you're doing, I don't know, give, give me a good three-exercise circuit. Dumbbell queens. What would you put up to that? And let's say stability ball rollouts. Okay, well, let's say someone's extremely overweight. Let's go with dumbbell queens, um, incline push ups, and what was the other one you said? Well, let's just call it like an elevated front plank. And a front plank. Okay. Um, so you would ideally want to probably have lower reps on your clean and expand the time under tension for the push up and the plank. So that, and that's the purpose of the plank. That's the purpose of that third exercise. So when we, when we write circuits, we always have the highest intensity first, that should be fairly heavy. It should be at a lower rep count. Then you can move into a higher rep, more moderate rep count, more moderate weight. And then I do like to have kind of along with what Eric's going with is more just like a body weight stability exercise where you're just working on control of the muscle and time under tension of the muscle. Um, you know, and eventually that can get into including overhead carries, suitcase carries, um, weighted, uh, or excuse me, holding tension with movement. But um, let's go. Let's go back really quick. So with the dumbbell clean, you know, you want to be able to try to do like five reps in that circuit. So start light. Start with twenty pounds. Start with 15, 20 pounds, and work your way up. And you should feel like you can you can do the exercise. Um, and most times we're holding ourselves back a little bit. So you should feel like you need to, you, you should feel like you have one or two reps left before you put that weight down. Um, and then I typically like to tell people in terms of rest, when their goal is general fitness or weight loss to take your time, but hurry up. Meaning go ahead, catch your breath, get a little sip of water, wipe the sweat off your brow, but don't just rest until 
you know, you're super comfortable because that's not what you're there to do. You're there to stimulate your body to, for change to, in a direction that you're looking for. So I, I love the line, take your time, but hurry up because we're trying to get all this work in an hour. So we just, we just mentioned the first series, dumbbell cleans, push-ups and a, and a side plank or something like that. That's just the first series. We would probably have you do three to four rounds of that and then two more series uh, or circuit circuits, so to speak, uh, before we cool down, before we end the workout for that day. But you, you mentioned an exercise that I'd never heard of before um, or seen before, really. I think you said it was a, um, a split clean. Mm -hmm. you, say, you say a kettlebell split clean? Yeah. You want to demonstrate that one for us? Absolutely. So I'll move it back. So the premise is, and I, like, I do like you starting with like light, is a lot of people want to or think that they need to, I'm going to build up to do some exercises. You really don't. Um, and this one, this split clean for someone starting off, it actually decreases the demand of lower back getting loaded. So a lot of times when people like they'll come up and they'll catch that lower back will be arched, right? So regular. So the split clean is as you're moving, you're going to catch and shuffle your legs back. And like you catch in a split squat position. I mean, um, I'll move this back, see if we can drop down and see the legs a little bit. But that's essentially what it is. I really like that exercise, actually. I don't use that with clients. I'm going to start throwing that in. And hold. And you can alternate legs. You come up, you load, you catch, leg splits. And then if you want, right, you want to make it a complex, you can clean it, split it, and then go to a squat. Um, it's very an athletic movement, but it teaches people to move arms, hips, and legs all at the same time. So you're getting intra and intermuscular movement and coordination. And that's the biggest thing. So I like that. Let's make the first series a split clean with um, with the with the incline push-up and then the side plank. That would be the first series, four rounds of everything. I would probably do five to eight reps per side for the split clean, move into anywhere from 10 to 15 push-ups, and then do, um, do, do 30 seconds per side for your side plank. Um, and like I said, four rounds, take – Take your time, but hurry up. And then how would we move into the, the next series? Where would you start us off? So I'm, we're going to a, a probably a lower body dominant exercise with bilateral. So either a squat or a deadlift. And usually in past history, you know, most people need to know how to squat more than deadlift. Deadlifts are good, but people have a harder time learning them with the lower back positions. It's a very tough position to manage the hips going backwards. Um, I do think squatting is more important. So the ability is something for someone to squat all the way down. So I am 100% taking that to a squat pattern. Okay, my bad. Because, yeah, we thought we already talked about a squat pattern, but yeah, we switched it up. Okay, so squat first. Yeah. Um, any squat pattern could be like a TRX squat, could be oh. a barbell squat, a goblet squat, a dumbbell at your side squat. But I, I, you I'm, I, I totally agree. I think for when people we, when starting we, off, I start. Here's my progression for, for new clients. I start body weight. I see can they squat down? Can they get parallel? Can they do they not get stuck? Once they get a set or two, and I'm very much into isometric, so I like to have people hold the bottom and feel what a squat is because most people just they're like down and they come up quick and they're like, okay, I'm done. I want them down holding to feel what muscles are working to, to let them to stand. So, like the first set's body weight. If they nail that, then I'm going. Goblet position, excuse me, goblet position, and I stick with that for about three weeks. Uh, if they can progress, I'll eventually progress them. But getting them to master heavy weight holding through here as they lower down, I think that's where everyone, in my opinion, needs to start before they just start putting barbells on. Now, if you have a coach who can coach you efficiently, that's a different story. If you feel like, hey, I want to try barbell back squats, go for it. But make sure you're feeling abs, glutes, and everything on, and, and you're not losing range of motion. Because we see it very often, you know, kids will, kids can goblet squat or, or adults can goblet squat like nothing. They will drop down to the floor. And as soon as they get something on their back and they exchange position, they get stuck halfway because it's a whole new movement pattern. So it's a whole new learning curve for them. And that's all changing movements or changing weights is. It's just changing 
how the body loads and how it's going to respond to that load by position and pattern. Yeah, like I think a big thing too that I notice is that it's a lot harder for people to to master the deadlift, especially that hinge pattern, and when it's like the second series of the day, um, mm-hmm. unless they're more of like a an advanced lifter. So I, I agree with you going into the squat pattern. I think it's really hard for people to ke- keep their hips in extension when they're at the bottom of that squat, and they get that lower back rounding, they get that butt wink coming underneath. And it's usually due to overactive quads, overactive hip flexors, like we talked about in the beginning, and weak hamstrings. So I think just by mastering that exercise through body weight is a great way to do it. But another way I like to kind of throw gas on the flame, so to speak, and, and try to get them to master that quickly is I love pause reps. I love isometric strength building at the bottom of that squat. So sure, I might have somebody on their on the wall, even just start there. Uh, like a wall slide. Maybe maybe they have a foam roller on their back and they're using it as like a wall slide to move up and down. But the, the purpose of being able to hold that bottom position is neurologic coordination because sometimes your brain just, it's, it's like a functional scoliosis. You go to, you stand up, everything is great in great alignment. You go to squat and your whole body kind of collapses on itself because it, it just doesn't, it's not used to the coordination of what needs to, to stay firing, what needs to do what. Um, so just by giving your body time to kind of click save on that position can be the world of difference to feeling, uh, you know, the squat in your feet and in your hamstrings and in your core versus feeling it in your knees or your hips or your lower back. And I think that's, that's the most important thing for any exercise, but especially the squat, because people squat every day. They go to the bathroom, they sit in cars, they sit in desks. Now it's not a low squat. But the difference is, so you would, some anyone would say, well, if people squat every day, they should be able to do it. But that's not the case because they're having something support them. So their body's not working to understand position because they're sitting on something. And that's where you see when people get lower than what they're used to, they can't hold position to muscle. So pause reps and squats are. They've even. You did ask me a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you asked me a question about neuropathy the other day, and I didn't answer it, but that's that's the avenue. Pause, pause, understand movement, understand vibrations and holds to understand patterns. That is that, that is the goal and goal. That's why I do love eccentrics, especially isometrics at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, they've even shown in studies that the way we sit on the toilet actually kinks our digestive system versus having our you know, they have this, this squatty potty, which is like a stool for your feet so that you're more in a deep squat. And that's when our digestive system has better alignment to, you know, excrete, to, you know, get things out of the system. Um, and, you know, I think along with uh, positional holds, isometric, isometric strength, uh, you know, I also like teaching people how to contract the muscle better. So we talk about one and a quarter reps or one and a half reps, whatever people like to refer to it as. But it's basically this idea that you go down all the way to the bottom of your squat, you come up a little bit, go down again, and then come all the way up. And it just teaches your body better contractual strength of those muscle fibers, which is going to translate over to better control. It's going to translate over to better performance and better results for your workout. Yeah, the, the whole concept of, and this has been thrown back and forth, is the time under tension, the time, like, I don't really use it as a, a method, but from a neurological learning standpoint, every every set and rep is a time under tension concept, but it's not going to give you more strength than versus another, but it um, teaches the neurologist to understand how to hold and create structural tension. That's the biggest thing, because we know right. speed increases in any any aspect of life things shut off. You know, people want to go run really fast, but they don't have the sound base or structure. They're going to fall apart eventually because speed hides a lot of things that you can't see. Same thing. They'd be like, you're, we use this reference or building a house. If you build that really fast and really quick and you're not meticulous on nails and screws somewhere, it could bow a little bit because you don't have a solid foundation. It's the same thing, you know, starting, an exercise program, especially if you're a beginner, is like just build that foundation. Just teach your body to learn, and then you'll get more out of it in the long run. Yeah, yeah. And um, 
you know, moving forward again with this, with this workout for, for general fitness or weight loss. Um, you know, we already did the clean or the, the split clean, excuse me. We did the push up, we did the side plank and now we're moving into the squat. The next thing I like to pair that with is, is a type of pulling exercise that can be pull-ups. If you can perform them, that can be uh, inverted row, like the bar behind Eric, him getting underneath that and pulling his chest up to the bar. If you have TRX straps, resistance straps, that's a really good way to, to vary the intensity based upon your uh, um, physical you know, fitness level. Um, and that can be really easy for people to do um, because you get to a point where you're basically kind of standing and just leaning back a little bit and still rowing, and getting good tension on the body. That's really good when you have like a lot of weight on your system that you're trying to lose. That's the, you're still performing the, the pulling exercise. Um, and then I would, I would actually get them down on all fours and do like a bear hold probably at this point. Yeah. Or unless you have another one that you want to throw in. You no, know, I'm fine. I teach isometrics. Um, I, I do rather, instead of like, people will be like, Oh, why don't you do a seated row or a dumbbell row? Like, yeah, that's great. But inverted rows and chin ups, where if you're lifting your whole body mass, I think it's more beneficial. And, and by, I hope a lot of people are understanding that we've done like a full body, upper body, core exercise, lower body, upper body, core exercise. So you're hitting all these different movement patterns. I don't even want to even call them muscle groups, but people will refer to them as muscle groups, but you're hitting these core patterns for everyday movement. So this isn't just going to be like, a, oh, we're going to do a leg day, upper body day. We are making sure the whole system is being fused from a hormonal standpoint to a structural muscle standpoint. That's how we create train, change. That's what we were saying before, and we can repeat it over and over again in probably future videos as well. The yep. best way to ensure progress is have various stimuli of getting the body uncomfortable. That could be uncomfortable in its hormonal demands, in its metabolic demands, in its strength and you know acetic, acetylcholine muscle firing demands. Um, and, and that's the purpose of using total body in everything that we do. You know, we're not we're not bodybuilders. We don't we can't get away with just doing one muscle group every week because we don't have the hormone profile to support uh, that that recovery and that growth period the way that a the, uh, the hormone profile meaning the the synthetic the fake hormone correct, profile that correct we, we can't beat around the bush we got to be straightforward with people so people right. don't get confused but ninety nine percent of the time you're looking at a bodybuilder and they're injecting steroids or they're orally taking steroids. And it's increasing their hormone profile to the point where they can get away with doing one muscle group a week because their body's going to keep building from that breakdown of that muscle. They still have to work hard. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to diminish yeah. the hard work that they're putting in. But um, it's just not conducive to general population, to someone's looking to lose weight, um, or just general fitness. Um, so I think the, the next piece is going from um, – when we go from these two exercises that we're talking about for strengthening purposes and taxing the system purposes, we're always adding a positional core exercise, typically core, um, to help improve the way that your body functions and improve your um, instincts for core control. And that's why we're talking about the obliques. That's usually the, the first thing that people don't know how to engage. And then that's why I have people in a bare position a bare hold position to really focus on that contraction of that, that cylinder. Um, but how would you want to start us off with the, the last series, third series? So third series, it's going to be, you know, this, if it's, if it's men and women, it's usually two different, two different, but similar ones, right? Usually this, you don't have to be the case. Usually women want more posterior chain glute work. I'm fine with giving that men want arms. Now, they're both going to be contingent together, right? So you're going to do a posterior chain exercise. So for me, that's either whether it was a single leg glute bridge or glute or hip, or hip lift off the bench or a glute hamstring hold. I'm hitting that posterior chain to make sure that I don't really care about size and, and all that stuff. It's more about can those hamstrings hold the pelvis in the right position and the right posture throughout the day, throughout the life so we can limit pain. And I think a lot of people don't do enough posterior chain hamstring work to allow that mechanism to happen. So that gets thrown in there. Now, a lot of people are going to think, oh, you know, that's not a big caloric burn exercise. But we already hit our big exercises early. This is more accessory work to give your body 
pos structural position and stuff you might work on. So that for me, that, that's going to be one. And then a heavy hitter that I like to com combo together is dumbbell curl to press for men and women. Like you're going to get biceps, you're going to get triceps, you're going to get delts. And a lot of people do this exercise every day and they don't realize it. When they go to put a shirt on, they, you know, they curl the shirt, they've got to reach and people need that stability. They go reach in cabinets, they pull themselves up into cars. Like that is important. Also, you know, if people want toned arms, it's going to give them that. So this is where I'm going to take it then. We're going to go first exercise, a single leg RDL. And then the second exercise, I'm going to have an, in a half kneeling curl to press. And then the third exercise is goal specific or male, female dominant. Right. Maybe they're going to do like uh, just some glute bridges or maybe they're going to do some hamstring kills on a physio ball. That'll really fire on the hamstrings and the glutes. And then if you're a guy, maybe you're doing um, some triangle push-ups for more triceps, some diamond push-ups. And, and this is where an, like another kind of, one. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just, just going to say, actually, have some fun with it because yeah. one of them that I, I like to do for a finisher is be in a push-up position, put your feet on a physio ball, and you pull your knees in. So you're doing like a – a knee tuck with that physio ball and you're doing, and then you can do a push up from that position. So I like to kind of alternate between the two push up, knee tuck, push up, knee tuck, and just keep going until you're gassed out. And usually people can get to about 10 to 12 before they're they They can't even do the push up anymore. There's exhausted. Yeah. And, and that's where, because people have the goals. And I think people listening and people watching or understand that you have goals. We all have different goals. Yeah. We can write, a model to, to drive like optimal workout, but at the end, this one should be to where you your goals want because there's nothing worse than you know leaving the gym being like, Well, I really wanted to have bigger arms and they didn't do it. And I've heard that many times from clients or other people training. It's like, Well, you know, I, I always want this, but they never do arms with me. It's like, We'll tell them next time because someone will respect that. So I always Asking people and ask yourself, hey, what do you? What's your end goal? Finish with something that finish. Finish with something that's going to drive you down that road that's going to lead you to where you want to be. Because if you never take that road to where you want to be, you're not going to get there. And I think that's in this world of of training and gym and program design. That's where people get lost. They like they or they get, they do too much of it. They do too much of it. I just want arms, and they miss the other stuff, or they're like. Well, I have to follow this program, and it has deadlifts, squats, push-ups, and rows. And I want, you know, I want to work on my glutes and deltoids. Well, find a program that puts it in there for you. Yeah, no, I think it's so true. I think it's important to make sure your workout's also going to give you some enjoyment. I think, I think, in the beginning is when it has to be more serious, because you have to like, you know, really make sure you're covering all your bases and be really like understanding the steps of everything and having a nice organized way. But then when you get into the rhythm, you should be enjoying yourself to a, to a degree, at least enjoying the process. And I, I do like at the end kind of throwing something in there more for um, whatever the individual wants. You know, some people just want to work on their shoulders more. Some people want to work on their biceps more. Uh, some people want to work on their core more. Um, but then even beyond that, uh, you know, say that we did these three series. We had A, which was four sets of um, dumbbell split cleans mm -hmm. with a push up and a side plank. That was series A for four rounds of. Um, yeah, so yeah, for four sets, excuse me. And then series B was the squat, the row, and the bear hold, oh, yeah. and do three. Three rounds of that, and then Series C was our um, single leg RDL, half kneeling curl to press, and then a goal specific, so like hamstring curls or glute bridges or tricep extensions or triangle push-ups. But then after all that work, you should be at that 45-minute um, to 55-minute mark from warm up to, to all the things we talked about, you should be at that 45 to, to 55 minute mark. There should be probably like five minutes left. Um, and no, it, 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 right. I was just going to say, when we, 
if you get 35 minutes in, you're like, hey, that was it. That's fine. Love it. Love it. Now, most people are actually going to overshoot when they first start. They're going to take like 90 minutes in their first workouts. And that's okay because you're kind of learning. You're taking your time to, to check the program sheet. You're trying to ensure everything's going well. But when you get into it, when you get into the routine of it, it shouldn't go past 60 or else you're too taxing on your system and you can possibly be deconditioning your body, making yourself worse. And this is a, a theory of or the, the idea of overtraining. Um, but well, you get into, you're missing, you're missing your, your hormone profile, like 60 minutes growth, growth hormone really falls off after that. 45 is showing like testosterone really falls. Uh, yeah. for, for, you're getting for, like a, for women, the, 30 minute mark, the first 30 minutes is the most important for testosterone and growth hormone. So to get the most out of it, it's like, and this is where I don't really like a 15 minute warm up, especially for women, because it's like you need to capture as much possible for them in 30 minutes. That needs to where your first two series of heavy hitter exercise need to lie. Now, there's nothing wrong with more than 90 minutes, but just to know like your goals and what your hormones are going to do are going to change. So, and I used to be a 90 minute person working out. I would go for like an hour, 75 minutes lifting and conditioning. And then you read this literature and says, well, really over 60 minutes, unless you're on exogenous hormones or synthetics, like you're, you're kind of tapping out and it's not going to benefit you anymore. Now that's yeah. it. You break it up multiple sessions in a day. That's a different story. Right. But just to give you, like, you really don't want to be in the gym more than 70 minutes. Like, Get in and get up. Because the risk factors include adrenal fatigue, metabolic dysregulation, hormonal dysregulation, and then you're you're gonna just be totally detrimental to your goals. But here's the thing is winning fixes everything. So as long as you're healthy, happy, strong, and fit, that's what matters. If you start to notice yourself plateauing in different areas or your recovery is off or you're constantly sore or you can't fall asleep at night, then you got to probably change, adjust something um, or at least vary the, the um, add some variance into your week. If you're going to have a day of a two hour workout, sure, but the next day has to be followed with more of like a parasympathetic workout to help aid your recovery system. But I think what I, where I was going with it is I do like to have sort of like a finisher after all of this is said and done so warm up series a series b series c and then a, a finisher but prior to the cool down so finisher can be sometimes i'll have people do walking lunges until failure sometimes i'll have people on like a row machine or an uh, elliptical and have or a fan bike and have them do some um, tempo work maybe 30 on 30 off or maybe 10 second bike sprints with 30 seconds rest. And we do five to 10 of those, just like an extra little, um, what do they call that? Like a burner, extra little yeah. finishers, conditional work, energy system development at the end. Like that's usually kind of the structure of a general pop after burner, after burner. Yeah. And it's usually yeah. like, I think well, I hopefully you get like, like maybe 10, 12, 10 minutes or something like that, where you can run enough interval time. Um, you know, a very popular one is a Tabata, like literally four minutes and then you're done. It should be intense. It, it's there to drive adaptations from that. It doesn't have to be, you know, 30 minutes of conditioning. It's going to be something where after all the lifting, you're going to start biasing your system towards some sort of energy development, a finisher, metabolic conditioning, and then you call it a day. And that's just the also at, of at, how, how at any this point. Because at this point, too, um, you've depleted a lot of your glycogen and your body's more in a fat-burning state. So by you putting that high demand on your system, you're just um, doubling down on your caloric burn. So if I'm someone who's trying to lose a lot of weight, I'm going to try to max my system out to a degree at this point. Um, maybe if I, if I have, you know, if I'm extremely overweight or if I have bad knees or something like that, maybe I'm on an elliptical or a bike again, and I'm just trying to exert myself and move it as, as fast as possible for 10 seconds, 15 seconds, rest a minute and repeat. I do like Eric's suggestion of using uh, Tabata because you're done in four minutes. Was Is that 10 on, 10 off? It's, uh, it's, 20 it's, on, it's, 
20 on 10 off. Okay. Eight rounds, which is like, it's literally four minutes, but it biases like you're, you're driving. It does become an aerobic activity. So you get an aerobic adaptation through short range because the rest is so little that the aerobics is, you're, you're training yourself to be more metabolically efficient. Like at the end of the day, that's what you want your mitochondria to turn over, burn fat more, and be like, hey, we can use these energy substrates and burn more calories at rest. And then the last piece of our workout day is the cool down. We talked about the threshold of going from rest to work. It's a little bit uncomfortable. Well, guess what? It's the opposite for the cool down. This should be more comfortable now. And I like to put people into different positions for breathing and just draining. I love the leg drain. Just Or if you're familiar with yoga, it's called waterfall. You're laying on your back. You're at, your legs are at a 90 degree, and they're right up against the wall. They're vertical on the wall. And you're going to sit there for three minutes, have your arms out at a T, and just breathe. Close your eyes and relax. Shut your system down. Get ready to rest and digest for the rest of the day. Um, Eric has one that he really likes, and it, it's um, a lot of studies around it, just walking for three minutes. It, and for me, it depends on the modality. So I had an athlete the other day. I, you know, she she was on the fan, the assault bike, and she was doing something. I was like, she was like, "What do I do after that?" I was like, "You're just gonna want to lie on the ground." And I literally put her legs up on a twelve-inch box. It was like, just breathe there. But yes, I do like just walking, right? Whether if it's a you know just like a light treadmill or just you know up walking like just down and back a couple times just to kind of but, pump and flow fluid through lymphatic drain and usually most people do that anyways right so post we're gonna you know if you're stretching you give them a towel they're relaxed they get up and this is why I like you know having locker rooms because people have to you know remember at Eagle Rocks, they have to either go downstairs or they have to walk to the locker room. They're not just like, all right, I'm done. I'm just going to go sit on the couch. They have to get up and move and walk around. And if you're, if someone's crunched on time and you're at a gym and you know, you shower at the gym, right? That's a perfect thing. You're going to walk to the shower. You're going to get into this warm shower with, and then heat can also drive more pumping mechanisms and, and beta dilation. Like that can be a, a sufficient cool down. You know, a lot of people think they yeah. need to sit and stretch for 10, 15 minutes. Well, that's not really the case. You're not going to get a crazy adaptation. You're just more just bringing yourself from that. Holy smokes. I just did a Tabata to, okay, I'm good. I'm calm. I'm bringing that heart rate back down to a resting recovery state. And what I do like to cue here is to like walk with intention, go super slow with your steps, swing your arms, really letting that like tension dissipate from your body. Remember we talked about earlier, the tensor gritty structure. We need tension in our body to give ourselves integrity, especially during exercise and specific movement patterns. Well, guess what? That, that fight and flight time is over. It's time to shut the system down, let that tension dissipate and let your body come back to its more natural state of rest and digest. It's going to improve the way you recover. It's going to improve the way you feel later in the day. And it's going to improve the way that you feel going into your next workout. So I think a lot of times what I see people do is they go right to work or they go right. They walk out of the gym, go right to their car, and they're still going 100 miles an hour. So that's why it's so important in terms of the computer processing, our central nervous system processing, to at least spend two to three minutes, turn your phone off, just relax. If you're going to do a positional hold for a stretch, that's great. If you're going to walk, that's great. But I need you to shut your system down. I don't want you overly stimulated because that hypervigilance is going to keep that central nervous system in the fight and flight mode. And you're going to get to a point where throughout the day, you're going to hit a wall hormonally and metabolically, and you're not going to get to fully recover from the workout. And you're not going to be prepared for the next session. And if you, I always say, other ways to do like breathing is a great way. Slow, controlled breathing. Now, if you get done with the finisher, you're like, you want to be breathing fast, like deliberately slow and shut it down. It's, at first, it's going to feel uncomfortable, but that really stimulates the vagus nerve to say, hey, we got to shut down and calm down. Another avenue, um, and you can start using like outside things, right? If you're a person who listens to music, you might have your gym playlist, but then you might have your cool down playlist where it's, it's more common music, right? So I know some people can't listen to country music while they're working out, but it, it can be more of a mellow thing. You can listen to like songs that are just more chill 
that'll bring your autonomic nervous system down for, for the time being. Like you don't you don't have to be blaring Metallica like 24 seven because that's going to keep you stimulated. There's stuff like that where yeah. you can start doing to bring yourself back and then down and to recover. Right, but those are you know outside things. The, one of the biggest things you can lift this towel. It's like you get that, put it over someone's face. It's cool. So you get the familiar. Yeah. Um, the middle a million dive effect you put something cold on your face it smells good the aromas it automatically just like okay the system's like breathe cool down it's gonna slow the breathing now it's like breathing into a paper bag but it tells that yeah. person like hey everything's okay we can relax and sometimes that's like yeah. all you do is a wet towel or wet something put it on someone's head who's had a good workout and let them lie there for like you know a minute or two they're gonna be like wow that was a great workout but i feel good because you're changing stimulus because of the wet, the cold, and you're damning their breathing through that. And if yeah. you're at home, you just try that. Get a towel like that. Try it. It feels good. People love wet towels around the back of their neck, their head, because the head, the hands, the easiest way to dissipate heat, right? So when someone's hot working out, they're trying to get up. Something cool in the head is going to allow them to pay. The system can cool down because it knows it's really hot and running high. Relax, it's fine. It can boom, it can chill out. That's a good, you know, if, if someone doesn't have all that stuff, they just, I tell them to do that. Clients yeah, love that. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good way to do it. And you know, just kind of to make to simplify it, it's like it's called a warm up because you feel your body warming up. We talk about raising the core temperature one degree Celsius. Um, you're cooling down because you notice your body cool down. So if you're you should literally be aware of feeling like, oh, I'm, my body feels cool now. I'm no longer hot, overheated. I feel a little chill. And then you're cooled down. You're time, it's time to go back to your day and eat well, sleep well, and get ready for the next workout. And this was a, this was a great session, though. This is a kind of A to B, A to Z, excuse me, of breaking down a workout from warm, out, from warm up, um, breaking that down into the four categories. Let's recap really quick movement prep mobility core energy system priming and then we move into the series a which like we said we start with bigger body movements first we move into a secondary or accessory exercise and then a more core related exercise or a positional exercise or a time under tension exercise like a weighted carry or a plank or a side plank uh, and then we do that same thing going into series b series c Throwing a little fun, throwing a little more specific workouts to your your uh, glamour muscles, maybe, and then end with a little bit of a energy system cool down or energy system uh, afterburner effect there, and then cool down. So that was uh, structuring your workout accordingly. Uh, we talked specifically about weight loss and general fitness, but this absolutely applies to um, toning as well, building strength as well, uh, getting fit you know, generally speaking as well, uh, because this will be taxing on your aerobic system. It, it is absolutely uh, strength and conditioning. Yeah, that's one. If, if someone's like, listen, that's very basic, right? You could do that three times a week and the other days do some sort of cardio or moderate low intensity stuff. It is easily a repeatable, like exercise. Like you're you're going to get good in them, but you can repeat that through the days. Now, obviously, your body's going to get really efficient. You're going to get you can change it up, but that's like a program or a template that you can just take and do that. Hey, we do that Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You'll see numbers go up. You'll see efficiently see increase, and you know see where it takes you. And obviously, you're always measuring, especially for weight loss. You're measuring where that goes. Uh, but repeating yeah. those those training sessions is going to be paramount to see progress on all aspects of it. That's like basically, if you're really doing six big exercises. The rest are more accessory lightweight. It's, it's not like you have to go to a gym and do 12 to 15 exercises, you know, high rep, high volume, and people are like overwhelmed. Like that's just not how it goes. Six exercises, and that's pretty simple. With some conditioning to warm up, boom. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Because yeah, we had, I, I agree, I'd, I'd call the bigger movements that we did like six exercises, and then we had more three like stability core exercises. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, this was a great workout. Um, we'll keep doing these YouTube lives, Facebook lives, and uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoy and go and live your best life. Signing out.